I'm gonna go ahead and pray us in. Thank you, Father, for everyone who is in our community, whether they can make it or not. Thank you for those that are here and were able to make it. Please touch each and every one of their lives. Please help us to hear what you would have us here today from your message and please help me get out of the way so that you can speak through me and my agendas are out of the way and you would speak to our hearts today father and jesus name amen so we finished up sermon on the mount um a few weeks ago and the last time we celebrated easter thanks again to bb who I is not here today, but thanks again to her for that really cool Easter celebration that she put it together um, last time. If y'all missed it, you can check out the videos to that and to the Easter service in our Discord on our, on our YouTube channel at VR Church on YouTube. And um, those were pretty cool. And now we're on to studying the life of Jesus. We're talking, uh, we're going through Matthew 9 right now, Matthew chapter 9. And we're just getting to know him and getting to know his teachings better. Uh, we, if you're like me, I grew up in the church, but, and yes, I have read the entire New Testament, but I read it very quickly. <laughs> I didn't stop to think about anything. I did it as a checklist. Okay, I've read it. I didn't stop to think about any of the things it was teaching or anything like that. We tend to skim through and not stop and think, at least me. Uh, and when we do that, we miss out on a ton of richness. Because a lot of people ask, well, why didn't they put any detail? Because in like modern day, we expect, you know, all the stories to have all the detail. How were people feeling? What were they thinking? What were all the details? But with the Bible, that's not how it is most of the time. And what we don't understand, first of all, this is ancient literature, but also it was written in a way to make us stop and think. That was the practice. Was to, It's called meditation literature. We stop and we think about this, about how, what, if I were in that situation, what would I have been thinking? What would I have been feeling? Truly, if I were in that situation, because we like to, you know, uh, think that we would react. Uh, sometimes, often, we'll think that we would react differently, we would react better, but would we really? Um, how would we be feeling in that situation? So that's what it's meant to do, because it's more, it's much more human. It gets into humanity that way when you stop and you think. And so we're stopping and I'm trying to help y'all to think, but of course it's going to be from my perspective because I'm just me um, and we all come from different backgrounds, but that's what we're going to do with the um, life of Jesus. We're going to stop and think about all the things that we usually just glaze past. And one of them is one of the ones today that um, Matthew 9 and it is verses 9 through... 13. So last time we were looking at Matthew 9, we looked at the healing of the paralytic in the um, synagogue. It was on the Sabbath, I think. And um, the religious leaders got all mad because they were more concerned about the traditions, the religious traditions that they've known their whole lives instead of about the thing that the whole purpose of this is the people and the hearts of the people and the souls of the people and they lost track of that and we can do that the church I grew in and did that um maybe some of y'all were fortunate enough to enough not to have grown up in that but I did um and I learned to be that way I had to learn not to be that way um and that still taking you know we get ingrained these beliefs and these behaviors into our minds and our attitudes, our worldviews, and it's really hard to get out of those once you're in them. So it takes, but that's what Jesus is doing throughout his whole life, is he's coming in and he's taking all of their tradition and their, like their religious tradition and legalism, and they're just throwing it on its head 
and saying, nope, this is not what this is about. This is about shalom. This is about restoring relationship between God and each other and with ourselves because all the law and commands hang on the command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your intelligence. Love others as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. And he was here to teach us what that really meant. All the laws, even the ones that we look at and we think, oh, this is a weird, hateful law. If we stop, if we think it's hateful, then we stop. We don't understand it. We stop, we look at it, and we see what is this actually saying. We look at the original Greek, we look at it in, or Hebrew, and we look at it in context and we learn. So that's, sorry, I got off on a um, tangent there of study. <laughs> but um, this is, this, when we don't, we just miss out on a whole lot of richness and fullness of what is actually going on here. Besides just what we grew up learning and believing, if, if you're like how I did. So we're in Matthew 9, and I need to refresh here because it looks like my app isn't refreshing. Hold on. Give me a second. Anyone have any comments or while I'm refreshing my app? Okay. So Matthew 9, 9 through 13 is what we're reading today. So as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax booth. Follow me, he said to him. So he got up and followed him. As Jesus was having a meal in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said, those who are healthy don't need a physician, but those who are sick do. Go and learn what this saying means. I want mercy not and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Has anyone heard that one growing up? Or ever? Has any of y'all ever heard that story before? No. Okay. Um, I grew up with this story, and I always rushed by the part where it says it called the tax collector, Matthew. If you hadn't noticed, Matthew's actually the person that wrote this book. <laughs> and so he's talking about his own little story in here of how he was called to be part of Jesus' movement uh, in the middle of all these other stories of miracles. Uh, and in the middle of him fighting with religious leaders. Um... So I would always skim past this part and I would go straight to the juicy stuff where he's fighting with the religious leaders because that's more interesting. But I want to stop and take a look at this actual story about Matthew and his his life. And um, so if you don't know about ancient Rome and when like Jerusalem and Israel was being occupied by Rome, um, he was a tax collector, and the tax office that he worked at would have been uh, close to the border between territories of different... So it was very, very busy, busy booth where any like caravans in route between Egypt and the east would uh, get their taxes collected, and he was working this booth. So it wasn't just a little table like I always imagined um, growing up, that it was this little table off in the corner. This was a major booth. Like, think of it like international customs. It was a major thing. And so he collected the taxes and the customs fees from all this uh, traffic. And what you may or may not know, tax collectors were hated by the Jews. And I know that we don't like <laughs> tax collectors nowadays, but it was worse. It was much worse back then um, because the tax collectors for Israel were actually their own people who Rome had hired to collect taxes on their own people. So they were considered traitors. Not only that, but they also tended to get in the practice of, because they had all the power, 
uh, to let people in or out and so forth, Zake would make up extra fees and skim off the top or like do the fuzzy math so that they could get their own profit from it. And they were, so as a result, they were absolutely hated by the Jews. They were an outcast. And yeah, they were social pariahs. So then think about this from Matthew's point of view. Um, it is... It's like, what do you think that he would have been going through as an individual? <laughs> like, if you really stop and think about it. Anyone want to take a gander? Or... I know Vivi would have been able to help today, probably, because she works for TSA. <laughs> she probably gets that. But she would have gotten a lot of hate. Uh, Matthew, <laughs> Vivi probably does get a lot of hate, but Matthew probably got a lot of hate from that. Um, think about other like modern-day thankless jobs. Whenever you get a parking ticket or a speeding ticket or... Whenever you get someone knocking on your door collecting taxes or um, hopefully, you know, a TSA when they decide they need to do a search of all your stuff. Thankless jobs and you're usually not appreciated and you often get a lot of hate thrown at you by people. So... And if these don't resonate, think of another, think of in your own life, and you don't have to say it out loud, a type of a person or a group or a position that you just cannot stand. You hate these people. That when you think about them, you just get really angry. Left in, in America, left versus right politics, conservative versus liberal, pro this, pro, pro that. All kinds of things that we can think of today that would be a, p a people that you hate. And now put yourself in that person's shoes. Imagine getting shouted at for doing your job. Matthew was working for this government that was hated by the Jews and we're not sure why he took the job. It may have been because he didn't have much of a choice. We don't know. I know that in my own life, um, I live in Texas and oil, big oil and gas is the thing. This is the industry that is here. If you want a job, you don't always have a choice. If it's going to be finance or big oil. And that's it. Or medical, maybe. But... I got judged for working at a big oil company, big oil and gas company, and people would just immediately put me in a group because I worked for big oil and did not stop to get to know me, did not stop to ask about my views, why I took the job, any of that. They just immediately put me in a category and judged me based on that. And we don't know Matthew's views about Rome or the government or anything. But we know that he was there. He had this job as a tax collector. We don't know if he was one of the corrupt ones. We assume it because he was a tax collector in that time. Maybe he wasn't corrupt. We don't know. It doesn't say. But Matthew had to sit there day after day getting yelled at, yelled at getting hated. And he was taking all of this resentment in until it permeated in his soul. Think about that. Whenever you've got someone that is throwing hate at you, throwing judgment at you, telling you you're terrible, telling you you're not worthy, telling you you don't belong. Imagine having to hear that every day, day after day after day. You start to believe it. You start to believe you're not worthy. You start to believe you're terrible. Sometimes you just shut off your heart and stop caring at all. Try, anyway. But um, N.T. Wright says, 
I highly recommend his stuff. Um, and Mark for everyone. He 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 has two. Uh, this story has been written in Mark, Luke, and Matthew. So if you want to read the different accounts, it's in all three of those books. But in Mark for everyone, N.T. Wright says, And then one day Jesus came by. He didn't shout. He didn't swear. He didn't grumble. He did something totally unexpected. He said, follow me. And Levi, which is another name for Matthew. He had more than one name. And Levi, we are told, no doubt, with total astonishment all over his face, got up and followed him. Wouldn't you have? It was perhaps the first time for ages that someone had treated him as a human being instead of a piece of dirt. And then he goes on to say that Matt, that he found it interesting that Matthew, where Matthew plays the story. Because if you look before and after this story, it is going through you just healing miracle after miracle after miracle of healing before and after this and N.T. Wright says in Matthew for everyone think for a moment what life would have been like for Matthew day after day year after year suppose it was you you would sit in your hot little booth waiting for travelers to pay the toll as they passed from one province into the next and they wouldn't enjoy it nor would you then think what it would be like having a young prophet with a spring in his step and God's kingdom in his heart coming past one day and simply asking you to follow him. Yes, it would feel exactly like a healing miracle. Actually, verse 9, and this is in Matthew, hints that something even more has, is happening here. It would be like a resurrection. He arose, says the passage literally, using a regular word, the Greek word, Resurrection is the word that was used in Matthew here. He arose and followed. So it was like he had a resurrection, a new life. A new life just started for him. Out of this misery, out of this hate, out of this... Who even knows how he felt about this? But now all of a sudden he's got this resurrected new life. Just by following he immediately followed. So this person that was considered no better than a thief and his testimony was not honored in Jewish courts. A tax collector's testimony was not honored in court. He could not have a tax collector apparently um, in Jewish courts testify because they, would, they were considered corrupt and not worthy of believing. And Jesus called this person. He called this person who the Jews hated, and who they wouldn't listen to, to write the book of Matthew, which is targeted to the Jews, to prove to them that Jesus is Messiah. So think about that for a moment. That is crazy talk, right? So when you think that you're not qualified for something, could you imagine? It's like, th these people won't even listen to me, and you're calling me to write this book to them. <laughs> right? Think about that. It's like, we all think that we're not worthy we're not I, for, for definitely me <laughs> when when DJ contacted me said hey, you want to be an elder you want to lead the church in Final Fantasy I'm like psycho you crazy <laughs> I'm not qualified <laughs> uh, so it's like this is what God does this is what Jesus does this is exactly the kind of people he wants he doesn't want the people who think they're worthy who think they're qualified he wants messed up people like us. And he called this person to teach. So why do you think, if you have a thought on it, why do you think he called him to teach the people who hated him? I had to stop and think about that myself. It's like, put myself in those shoes. If I were called to teach the people who hurt me, right, in that people group. So in my case, it would be like me being called to minister to white chauvinistic men or spousal abusers. 
it would be like me being called to minister to those people specifically. That's what it would be like. I can't imagine that. Even even for me, it's like, I, no, thank you. <laughs> if you truly called me that, I would try to do it, but I, uh, I can't imagine. So I think, so when I was thinking through it, I think maybe, um, he, maybe he called him, he, it could have been multiple reasons, probably multiple reasons, but maybe, um, he needed to work through forgiveness in his own life, in his own heart. And this was how. That you have to be able to forgive to heal fully. And I've learned this myself. You have to be able to forgive. You can't heal unless you do. And it's not something we can do on our own. And um, It's only something we can do with his help. So Jesus called this social pariah to be his disciple. Again, he can use anyone. He can. Uh, his mission is based on mercy, not merit. He doesn't want the people who are worthy. He wants the people who are forgiven much. Because those who are forgiven much love much. No one is too bad to escape his love. And Matthew, again, he responded immediately. Luke says he left everything behind. He left behind this lucrative job that he had. It was his security. He left it. And if you think about it, potentially, he risked making Rome mad at him. Those people have weapons. They didn't have the systems we have today that are supposed to protect people. <laughs> um, it was worse then. So, and then it says, now we get on to the dinner, because he left, and so in other stories, I think it tells it in, in Mark and Luke a little bit more, but Matthew decides he's going to host a dinner for his friends, his other tax collectors, because, hey, look, there's this person here who treats me like a human being. He doesn't hate me. He doesn't throw judgment at me. He doesn't tell me I'm dirt. He wants me to be a part of his life. Look, meet him. And so he throws a dinner for his friends. His fellow tax collectors. And he invites Jesus and the disciples that are following him at that point as well. He throws a big dinner. That is the great unexpected news that he got there. That this is just new life that we can have. It doesn't have to be the way it is. And then the religious leaders find out about him. <laughs> and yeah, Matthew considered to be a sinner. He was considered to be unclean, ceremonially unclean. And so they were taught and they believed in that day that they had to stay away from anyone, from sinners, from people who were ceremonially unclean so that they don't get infected by the moral corruption. And I actually grew up with that. I was taught that growing up, that we had to be separated, that we couldn't hang out with those people, whoever those people are. Choose from your background. And that leads to separatism. It leads to the current division that we have right now, at least here in America. We definitely have it here in America. This division, separatism, us versus them. That's not what God wants. Not at all. So the these religious leaders, these Pharisees, question uh, him very accusatory um, that because that he he's calls himself a teacher and he's expected to be an example, he's expected to live out his life as an example to these other people, and the company that he was keeping implied that he didn't care about that. He didn't care about that law. He didn't he didn't care about the laws, the traditions, um, and so his opposition increased. His critici the criticism of him increased Jesus. And um, political, cultural, mo social, religious, all kinds. It, they would, he just kept getting opposition and opposition from anyone who ha was happy with the status quo. Of They wanted it to be 
the way it is because they benefited from it. Jesus was all about flipping that on its head. And so, let's see, what did it say? So the Pharisees asked, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? They asked his disciples. And when Jesus heard this, he said, those who are healthy don't need a physician, but those who are sick do. Go and learn what this means. I want mercy, not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus' response is, who needs a physician? Those who are sick. It's because they're sick that they he's with them. Um, because spiritual illness needs spiritual healing. A doctor can't do his job if he can't it doesn't get near his patients. And this is a reference to Old Testament. So they were soaked in scripture way more than we are today, but this is actually a reference to Old Testament where we're talking about um, prophecies of the Messiah. And the, in Psalm, there was a prophecy about the Messiah being he for, who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. The Messiah was prophesied to come and heal. But I will restore your health and your, heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because they call you an outcast to Zion, for whom no one cares. He comes to heal the hearts and the wounds of the outcast, for whom no one cares. This is from Jeremiah 30, 17. He's bringing healing he's bringing shalom and when he says go and learn this is a teacher method <laughs> um this is a rabbinic term that meant to go study the text because you didn't understand it you didn't understand what it was saying so go study it again and he was saying this to the religious scholars and authorities of the day these people were supposed to know scripture front and back better than anyone and he's saying nope you got it wrong go read it again and he's referencing when he says, I want, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He's referencing an old prophecy in Hosea. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And what it's meaning is that true worship is what he wants. And this true worship had turned into a ritual, turned into a tradition, and they'd lost the heart of the law. They lost the heart of the greatest command, and they were preserving all of these traditions and these practices and rituals and stopped, they failed to understand and remember the heart of everything. The whole reason all these things came into being in the beginning, in the first place, was because of the heart of it, which is love for God, for ourselves and others, for others as ourselves. And God cares more about our spiritual health than he does flawless worship. Does anyone have any thoughts or anything? Because I've talked a lot. But yeah, I never stopped and studied that until now, really. For this service. <laughs> but growing up, whenever I read that, um, there are different translations that make it think, I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners. Because there's other translations that make it seem like he's talking about, I didn't come to call like the Pharisees because they're righteous. That's not what it says. I, but that's what I grew up believing. Um, but it's actually saying he's comparing the Pharisees with the ones that were in the day of Hosea where they cared more about the burnt offerings than they did the worship. And he's saying that they also need him. They just don't realize that they're sick. We all need him. We all need his healing whether we think we do or not. And the compassion or mercy is characterized in his entire life here and in what he's asking us to do. 
in his stead while he's before he comes back until he comes back he's inviting people to change their ways and accept him as messiah and this goes back to the beatitudes in uh, sermon on a mount um if you want to go check that out again but he's healing not just physical ailments but he's healing broken hearts he's healing nations he's healing the world this is shalom shalom is complete wholeness with nothing missing and it got broken when humans decided they wanted to be god instead of of god they wanted to make themselves as god and we all do this all the time even now all of us want to take charge of our own lives and be on god's define evil and good for ourselves instead of listening to the one who is wise and who made all of us and knows what is good and what is not and it's easier for people to label people as an outcast than it is to work towards healing with those people and humans social acceptance all of that is very fleeting they can turn on you so quick and uh, it's fleeting and social acceptance can mask the reality the reality is that we are human beings who jesus loves period he loves us regardless. And we can know that his love is unfailing. Where humans, where society, where all of that fails us, he does not. He still loves us. He never will fail us. And that's the example that he lived out in his own life. And Jesus is working even today to take the world from where it was, from this world of death, corruption, greed, all these kinds of evil to this whole new way of life. And he's inviting us, like he did Matthew, to be a part of that. And we don't have to sit silently and wait for him to return for things to get better. We don't have to just accept that this is the way things are. He's saying it's not. Truly, it's not the way things are. And we can work now as his agents to bring about healing and make this world a better place. And we can know that he'll be with us every step of the way. That... We can work even now to make this better. That is the story of the call of Matthew. And that's all I have to say. Did anyone have any thoughts or anything about that? If not, then I'll go ahead and close us in prayer. Thank you again, Father, for what you had us here today. And thank you for those that, everyone in our community, whether they were able to make it or not. Thank you to those who are going to be watching this later on demand. Please help us to remember what you've had us here today and think about. Don't let us walk away and forget this. Help us to... Remind us to think about this as we go through our week, as we go through our lives, as we encounter these types of situations. Remind us what your true heart is here. Help us to remember and help us to live out this invitation that you've called us into. And in Jesus' name, amen.